with Iran. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. David Christ. Thank you for the introduction, and I wanted to thank General Myatt for the invitation. Um, the former director of the Marine Corps History Program, uh, Brigadier General Ed Simmons, who ran it for about 25 years that some of you may know, uh, once told me that uh, if a Marine is going to join a club, the one club he should join is the Marine, Corps, is the, uh, Marine Memorial here in San Francisco. And uh, while I'm biased being a Marine myself, I do think this place is a national treasure, and it is an honor to be here. As I look around at this audience, I am also reminded of uh, the sage words a professor gave me many years ago that I chose to ignore. And he said, when you're going to write a book about a subject as controversial as Iran and the Middle East, make sure the topic is old enough that all the participants are dead. <laughs> and uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, uh, I didn't do that. And um, it's been amazing as I give uh, talks who's been in the audience who was a participant in it. Um, so I certainly welcome the questions and answers or uh, a discussion afterwards because it, it's, a, it's a fascinating subject and, and, uh, and everyone has a different perspective on it. Ryan Crocker, uh, Ambassador Ryan Crocker, who is I think one of the, uh, the most experienced Middle East hands we've produced in, in many years, whose actual first posting as a, as, a, as a young foreign service officer was to Khorram Shah in Iran in the early 70s said that for Iran, history is not the past, but the present. And I think that's a, a really accurately captures uh, the current state of affairs between the two countries. We're both really captive by the baggage of our own his historical experiences since 1979, and maybe for the Iranians even earlier than that. But I think it's important, and one of the motivations I had for writing this book was to explore this history and try to understand it and hopefully uh, uh, in the process find some uh, ways that we can move forward between our two countries. In my talk tonight, I'm going to uh, focus primarily on uh, U.S. policy and some interesting trends that I've seen over the last 30 years uh, across multiple administrations. Um, but I don't want to ignore the fact uh, that this is very much a human story. Uh, U.S. policy against Iran has been made by young sailors standing in 130 degree uh, 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 temperatures on the, the deck of a warship in mine infested waters. They've been made by people like Ambassador Stan Escudero, who was a, a, a foreign service officer of uh, Mexican ancestry, who happened to be fluent in Farsi, who when the Revol Iranian Revolution happened was called out of a rather obscure job in the State Department to infiltrate the crowds of the demonstrators, where he would uh, stand in the front line shouting death to the Shah with all the other Iranian students, and then at night would go back to the U.S. Embassy and report to the ambassador on what was transpiring in the streets of the country. It's a story that's really been made by uh, people like Iranian uh, Captain Abbas Malik, who was the captain of a small Iranian patrol boat, the Joshan, which had the sole remaining missile, anti-ship missile, in the Iranian inventory. And at the height of uh, uh, an operation called Praying Mantis, which was the largest U.S. Navy's uh, uh, surface battle since World War II against Iran in 1988, he was ordered by his high command to turn and engage a vastly superior U.S. flotilla. And he did it, knowing that he was headed to certain death. And he launched his missile, which came within 50 feet of hitting the largest U.S. warship in the, in the Persian Gulf at the time. And at the cost, uh, the U.S. retribution cost him half his crew, his ship, and for Malik, his leg. It's a story of a gentleman like Taraji Riahi, another Navy Iranian captain who took an entirely different course. He was a, a, a very erudite man made wine in his own basement, and, and fundamentally opposed the Iranian Revolution. Riahi, uh, when his son turned 18, he wanted to get his son out of the killing fields of the Iran-Iraq War, and so he went to Turkey, where he obtained a visa for his son to go to Hawaii, but in return became one of the CIA's best agents. In the process, he would end up providing information to the U.S. that would avert a major Iranian attack on Saudi Arabia in, in October of 1987. U.S. forces intervened and turned back the Iranian attack, which probably would have led to a major Middle East war. In the process, he compromised himself and was executed for treason. 
Many pundits have said that the, the nations are engaged in a quasi-war. Uh, the audacious plot to, by used car salesman named uh, Arbab Siar to kill a Saudi ambassador in a popular Washington, D.C. restaurant, Cafe Milano, one I recommend going, although perhaps not when the Saudi ambassador is dining. Um, and what is clearly a growing cyber campaign between the two nations, uh, with the U.S. targeting Iran's nuclear program and Iran's responding against financial institutions of uh, the Gulf states and the United States. And I suppose I could even add uh, uh, drones, because just a, f a few weeks ago on November 1st, Iran opened fire on one of our drones in international airspace. Um, but in truth, I think, uh, in a very meaningful sense, America and Iran have been fighting a low-grade war uh, uh, over 30 years, since the 1979 revolution. And the Stutzniks virus or Cafe Milano plot are just the latest salvos in this ongoing conflict. For over 30 years, the two nations have been suspended between peace and war, between the light and the darkness and the twilight, hence the title of my book. And relations have ping-ponged back and forth between prospects of a hopeful dialogue for peace and the smell of cordite and the talk of war. And today, a deep tr distrust permeates the relationship, one that has hardened resolve on both sides. But the current nuclear standoff is, reality, is I think, uh, a symptom and not the cause of this animosity. For even if the P5 plus 1 talks succeed in resolving that piece of the crisis, the larger antagonism between the two countries remains. For the 1979 revolution enshrined anti-Americanism as a key pillar of Iran's foreign policy. And the young men who shouted death to the Shah and overthrew a, an unpopular American-backed dictator now have gray in their beards, but their, their attitudes remain unchanged. Tehran rejects the current status quo and sees America's ultimate goal of overthrowing the revolution. And I don't see any of this as likely to change for the foreseeable future. And in since the June 19, uh, 2009 elections, uh, many of the more pragmatic voices in the Iranian government have been marginalized. There are no easy answers for this. Um, either Iran's regional uh, aspirations or its nuclear program. The latter uh, is not something that lends itself, I think, either to a military solution or seemingly a diplomatic solution. As mentioned during the recent presidential debates, there is no more important foreign policy challenge facing the U.S. than Iran. And despite our government's pronouncement of a pivot to the Pacific, I'm convinced that reality will continue to take us back to the Persian Gulf. And the next conflict will not be against China, but against Iran, although Syria may give me a run for my money here. Um, for beyond just an attack on Iran's nuclear facility, war can occur through miscalculation or an incident at sea. And every few weeks, there's a, a potential conflict between Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guards, small boats, and U.S. Navy warships, any one of which could escalate into a shooting, a shooting match. However, unlike the Cold War uh, with the Soviet Union, there is no hotline or even diplomatic relations between the two countries. Meetings uh, uh, have been episodic and um, uh, with the primary means of passing messages through the Swiss by a fax. In fact, last year there was a proposal to establish a hotline between Fifth Fleet and the Iranians uh, over in Bandar Abbas, probably the Revolutionary Guard uh, Naval Headquarters in Bandar Abbas, but Iran rejected it. So there is no easy way to defuse a crisis if a shooting, uh, an incident at sea should escalate. And compounding this problem, I think, is that neither side has a clear view uh, of the other. We frankly don't understand what motivates the other's actions in many respects. And I think this is especially true for Iran. There's a great example, 1998, Operation Desert Fox that some of you may, may recall, which was a U.S. military response for Saddam Hussein expelling weapons inspectors. Anybody reading the New York Times would have understood that the U.S. military buildup was in response for Saddam's actions against the inspectors. But apparently the Supreme Leader's subscription to the Times had lapsed, and he didn't see it in that terms at all. And in fact, he saw it as a, a U.S. buildup aimed at regime change. And it very easily could have uh, uh, ignited a conflict that, frankly, the U.S. was wholly unexpecting. And frankly, for the, uh, the United States, Iran, uh, the U.S. has been rather poor understanding Iran's security motivations. During the early 90s, one of our uh, uh, main grievances, Iran, was their development of ballistic missiles, which we used as an, a, a rationale for not uh, engaging Iran. But if you understand Iran's experience in the Iran-Iraq war, the war of the cities, where Saddam just 
pummeled Tehran with Scud missiles, it created a massive panic in Tehran that nearly led to a, a revolt against the government. And that experience hardened Iran. It frankly reinforced their desire for have a deterrent capability. And frankly, I think it's a rational uh, decision on their part, even though it clearly works against American interests. And the U.S. has not always been the perfect guy in this. Uh, I confess my own American bias. I tend to think we're the good guy, but we're not the perfect guy. 1988, the USS Vincennes uh, a warship instigated a, a, a shooting match with some Iranian boats in Iranian territorial waters. At the height of this shooting incident, it mis mistook an Iranian civilian airliner for an Iran Iranian combat aircraft and shot it down, killing 290 people. Uh, the current head of the Revolutionary Guard Corps Navy today is a gentleman named Admiral Fadabi. He was commanding the small boats engaged in the fight with the Vincennes and remains convinced that this was a deliberate act of murder by the United States. And the U.S. actions after the fact didn't really dissuade him of that. Uh, Legion of Merit was awarded to the skipper of the Vincennes. And, um, uh, and frankly, the U.S. Uh, uh, deliberately, I think, obscured some of the truth of the, of the events. Um, even though, frankly, I, I'm, I'm fairly sympathetic for the skipper of the Vincennes' decision to shoot it down, the incident after the fact, I think, was, was, was really well, poorly done by the United States. And in George H.W. Bush's inaugural address, he reached out to Tehran with a statement that said, goodwill begets goodwill. And this resonated with Iran with a new president by the name of Rafsanjani. Rafsanjani, at some considerable expense, works to release the hostages in Lebanon that you may recall there was a number of Western hostages. It took him three years to do so. And when he finally gets the last one released, he goes to the, the intermediary in the United Nations ask, asking for, okay, we upheld our end of the bargain. What's the uh, goodwill on the U.S. side? And for the U.S. government at the time, what looked like a good idea in 1989, maybe not so much going into an election in the year in 1992, and the U.S. raises a new series of, of grievances against Iran and fundamentally doesn't upheld the bargain, uh, its side of the bargain. And Iran never forgave, forgave the U.S. for this. In fact, Richard Haas, who, who worked on the NSC at the time, a uh, number of years later met the Iranian foreign minister, and when he was introduced to him, the Iranian um, minister said, oh yes, Mr. Goodwill begets goodwill. Um, and while, while the U.S. has made mistakes, I think another one we have made is, uh, is frequently have taken the wrong course with Iran. When we need to be magnanimous, all of goodwill, but goodwill, refuse to extend the Iranians' hand. But we also, when we need to be tough on Iran, we vacillated. Um, I think we showed a disturbing uh, uh, lack of, of resolve to counter Iranians' uh, uh, malign attacks against the United States, starting with Beirut in 1983 and 84, where, where the intelligence was pretty, pretty convincing of Iran's hand be behind the attack in the Marine barracks and two attacks on the U.S. Embassy. And after considerable discussion and hand-wringing in, in the White House, the U.S. never retaliates in responses to that. And I think that has actually emboldened the Iranians into thinking that that asymmetric technique works, and it has traditionally. Equally as troublesome, I think, was in Iraq. Um, beginning in 2004 and 5, the U.S. found itself tied down in a stubborn insurgency in Iraq. Uh, Iran saw this as an ex uh, excuse to essentially erode U.S. resolve in the region. And through their, their uh, sort of secretive arm of the Revolutionary Guard uh, called the Quds Forces, um, they support various proxy groups that, uh, um, that uh, uh, orchestrate a campaign against U.S. forces in the region. And it was not until December 2006, about two years after this start, started, the U.S. musters enough resolve to actually counter what they're doing to us in Iraq. But by that time, 140 U.S. Army soldiers had died at the hands of weapons provided by the Iranians. And only uh, Vice President Cheney, who probably doesn't come out so well in my book in general, but he's the only one that I found who advocated a military response to Iranians' behavior inside Iraq, where he advocated some cruise missile strikes at selective Quds Forces target. But there was no stomach in the White House for that sort of uh, escalation. Each American president has grappled with two competing views of the way forward with Iran. One is accommodation, rapprochement, and whether 
uh, and the second one is whether the regime itself is a singular problem, i.e. regime change. And frequently, these two competing views have divided the U.S. government. It started from the very beginning. Jimmy Carter was split between two competing views on how to handle the revolution in the first place. National Security Advisor Brzezinski advocated a very muscular response, encouraged the Iranian generals to coup, contemplate introduction of U.S. combat troops if necessary to prop up the Shah. On the other side was Secretary of State Vance and the U.S. Ambassador in, uh, uh, Sullivan in, in Iran, who fundamentally believed that the Shah's days were numbered and the, US need, and the sooner the U.S. starts making its deal with the opposition movement and Ayatollah Khomeini, the better off we'll be in the long run. And, and frankly, Carter doesn't come down on either side very well. And as a consequence, he sends an a special envoy to Iran, uh, uh, Air Force General by the name of Dutch Heiser, with instructions that are so muddled that Heiser can't figure out what he's supposed to tell the Iranian generals. And both sides thought it was uh, to tell him a different thing. George W. Bush, I think, faced a similar predicament. Uh, his first, uh, uh, first administration, especially in his first administration, um, There were three major attempts in his first uh, uh, term, I guess, uh, to get an NSC-approved Iran strategy in front of the president. All of them failed. Um, there were deep divisions within his own government of how to approach Iran. Iran, after 9-11, had made a series of openings to the United States that frankly seemed quite favorable. And while nobody was under great illusions of, uh, of, of holding hands and singing Kumbaya with, with Iran at the time, there were people, uh, Secretary of State uh, Powell, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who thought there were areas where our two uh, nations uh, uh, overlapped or converged. And they thought we should work with Iran, including there was a proposal to establish a supply route for U.S. forces in Afghanistan through Iran at the time. On the other side, there was deep suspicion of Iran's motives. Uh, De uh, Peter Rodman, a senior official in the Department of Defense at the time, wrote that any official contact with Iran only gave support to the government and, quote, undermined our efforts to delegitimize the regime. And Secretary of State, uh, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld agreed with this and summed up these views in a memo to Bush in August of 2002 stating the long-term goal should be regime change and not accommodation. Uh, and, and essentially, the two competing views canceled each other out, and there is no concrete policy. Second Bush term is much different. There's, a, frankly, the president's a lot more decisive. There's a, a changing of the deck chairs of the administration that allows much more synergy. Some of the, the uh, more combative voices in the Department of Defense were gone, and there's a growth in Iran's enrichment program that really compels the U.S. to do something. And what they develop is a, a strategy called the Iran Action Plan that frankly remains the backbone of the current administration's views about uh, Iran and how to delay the program. Um, Reagan actually had uh, two different strategies, interestingly enough. He had, uh, in, uh, in 1981, there's an NSC directive that laid out the policy of the administration that said, one, the U.S. policy will be containment of the Iranian revolution, and two, search for Iranian uh, moderates that we could develop, cultivate, and pull Iran back to the western side of the Cold War. And so they do both of these simultaneously. There's a finding for the CIA to actually try to find people within the Iranian government we could work with, and at the same time, there's a pretty concentrated plan to contain Iran that will lead to a lot of efforts to prop up the, Iran the Iraqis in, in the war, intelligence sharing, uh, development of coalition efforts with the Gulf states, um, uh, a very orchestrated interagency effort to uh, uh, allow weapons to flow to Iraq and deny weapons for Iran. Um, and in January 1986, after the Revolutionary Guard uh, boarded one of uh, American merchant ships, there's also a much more active American military component to this strategy um, as the U.S. really starts gearing up war plans on, on the basis that Iran may st start stopping and seizing American ships and holding U.S. sailors hostage. But at the same time, the Reagan administration is looking for an opening. Um, the Iran-Contra um, uh, incident, scandal, whatever you like to call it, that uh, that sort of galvanized Reagan's second term with Iran, at least the Iran arms piece to that was really not a policy aberration. It was essentially what 
uh, William Casey, the director of the CIA, and others have been trying to do since 1981, just with weapons. The problem, however, is by providing weapons to Iran, it essentially undercut your containment strategy. So the two actually were at cross purposes. And when all this fails, Reagan will directly challenge the Iranians. When Iran starts expanding attacks into the Persian Gulf, the U.S. will, uh, will take decisive military action. It will lead to a, a very long, prolonged conflict with, uh, with Iran that will end up in a decisive defeat for the Iranian Navy and go a long way to actually uh, ending the Iran-Iraq war on uh, terms that were not favorable to the Iranians. I think every president has looked to the, the sexy view of covert action about the prospects of changing the Iranian regime. Is there a viable opposition movement inside the country? Are there exile groups outside the country the U.S. can work with? Uh, can any U.S. government agency take action that will affect regime change? I think these are questions that have been asked by every single administration since Carter. In September 80, 1982, the Reagan administration actually looked at authorizing and providing weapons to Iranian opposition groups. And uh, the basic issue was summed up, I think, in a, in a memo by an NSC official who's, who wrote, um, wrote, quote, the basic issue was whether the present regime is in U.S. interests. If not, the U.S. government should take more concrete actions to overthrow it. And it's caused a series of discussions from 1981 to 83 about the prospect of this. Can, will it work? Can we, can we find a movement inside the country? President George W. Bush went through much the same debate 30 years later. There's belief in some quarters in the uh, Defense Department that Iran was a brittle country, uh, ripe for overthrow, it was an unpopular government, and unlike the Soviet Union, was largely accessible to the United States. Huge diaspora here in the United States. I think the second most number of blogs on the internet are in Farsi. Uh, so it was a country that there was openings to. And, and as one official wrote, collapse of the Iranian clerical regime will deflate Islamist militancy worldwide, as, the, uh, as Rumsfeld wrote. And so they went through the same discussion. Uh, in, in 2005, there was an F, uh, a discussion by, led by Bill Ludi about arming some Iranian opposition movement inside the country, much like we had tried with the free Iraq forces, if you recall, uh, uh, in Iraq in 2003, which didn't end so well, but uh, the same concept. Um, but in the end, the downsides to all these seemed to always outweigh any potential benefit. The regime was seemed to be too entrenched. It has a, a pretty substantial base of popular support. Um, there's no opposition group or exile group that ever seemed to have the strength to really challenge it. And ultimately, if you support, say, the Kurds or the Baluchs or one of these uh, uh, large minority groups, you can end up balkanizing the country, which would not work to the Americans' advantage. Um, and so ultimately all these efforts failed, or at least were, were dismissed. So what does the future hold, having talked a bit about some of these themes in the past? Well, it's of course hard to predict. Um, there's a lot of different variables. Uh, nobody even has a, a, an idea of how Iran would re react if its nuclear facilities were attacked by Israel or somebody else. Um, I do think our current policy is uh, of diplomatic isolation and sanctions. Uh, have succeeded to a point. Um, there is absolutely no doubt the sanctions are biting, their currency is in free fall, and there's a 50% reduction in Iran's oil exports. Um, but I don't think that pressure alone is going to achieve what the U.S. wants, which is Iran giving up its nuclear weapons aspirations and avoiding conflict at the same time. In fact, there's a danger that if you apply nothing but pressure, it actually strengthens the Iranian hardliners and reinforces their view. Um, so I think, in addition to everything we've done, that there ha also has to be some other steps that, frankly, we haven't taken in our 30-year history with Iran, which is simultaneously doing sort of the American talk fright strategy, if you will. And that in addition to the sanctions pressure, I think there has to be a, a bold opening to re-engage diplomatically with Iran. I don't think talking to Iran should be seen as a reward for good behavior, as it was uh, particularly in, uh, during George W. Bush's administration, but rather a necessity for American security. And continuing to pass notes back and forth through a Swiss or some intermediary is a recipe, I think, for disaster in a breaking crisis. And bilateral interactions between the U.S. and Iran may not bring about a quick rapprochement, but at least they will help uh, uh, 
provide both sides clues to the other's red lines and insight in which other, uh, each other's country that frankly lacks now. And I think the U.S. as part of this needs to provide something tangible conjunction uh, beyond just words. Um, airplane spare parts are, are, as an inducement to Iran to giving up its program are simply are not going to work, I don't think. But they are a good inducement if you want to show a good faith uh, gesture. And our, our approach of a sort of a carrot and stick approach with Iran really uh, Iran sees as pejorative and I think has been sort of counterproductive. So rather than the carrot and stick piece, I like the term a golden bridge to Iran. In other words, provide them an, an opening or an opportunity. It's face saving, it's, uh, it's re-engagement, it's addressing their, national sec their own secur security interests as a way to reach out for them. But I think an important part of this diplomatic engagement has to be a more robust uh, 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 military uh, effort. Our current uh, set the theater posture in, in the region is, is pretty substantial now. There's more minesweepers now in the Persian Gulf than at any time since Desert Storm. Uh, there's a, elaborate ballistic missile defenses. It's pretty, uh, it's quite uh, sophisticated, I think, but it's expensive. In the era of the fiscal cliff, nobody wants to spend money. But I think we need to con commit ourselves to a long-term uh, military presence in the Gulf as part of a containment strategy if nothing else, to bolster the, uh, our, our Arab partners. And likewise, I think the U.S. needs to move robustly against the Iranian th uh, threat network and seriously look at countering uh, these Quds Force operations, which really have continued to push the U.S. Uh, uh, aggressively for almost 30 years. But it has to be done concurrently, I think, with the diplomatic initiative. But most importantly, I think the U.S. needs to accept that this is a long-term conflict akin to the Cold War. And our strategy needs to be bipartisan and dedicated not to the nuclear issue that everybody fixates on, but addressing the overarching, managing the overarching uh, um, uh, challenge of, of Iran, at least from America's interest. And that a credible deterrent combined with uh, active and I hopefully continuous dialogue may not eliminate the crisis, but at least might manage it. Thank you. Now it's a time uh, for a few of your questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Christ. Do you see uh, parallels with our foreign policy with Egypt and our foreign policy with Iran? How have we failed with both? Hmm. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. It was one that was asked to me by uh, a senior military officer not at the height of the, the issue with Mubarak. It was a challenge in both cases. In fact, the parallels between the Shah and, uh, and Mubarak, I think, are quite striking. In both cases, you have a long-term U.S. ally. In both cases, he's old, sick, probably at the end of his line. Um, but the opposition to him seems almost uh, you know, uh, worse in a sense. In the case of uh, a case, both cases, I don't think uh, there's a whole lot the U.S. could do about it. Um, I think the, 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 uh, the momentum to overthrow, to remove both of these uh, gentlemen was, was sort of took on a life of its own and was too substantial. In the, in the case of the Shah, we could have, we could have uh, gone the Brzezinski route, but fundamentally I think the opposition to him was too strong and he was, he was going to die in a few years anyway and nobody was any, uh, under any illusions that his son had the capability to run the country. So in that case, probably the answer would have been to cut our losses as early as possible, which is what Ambassador Sullivan recommended, and support the opposition group um, at least. And there were a number of substantial liberals within the, the opposition group at the time. You end up in the same situation with Mubarak. At some point, I think, I think the administration made the right decision. At some point, sentimentality has to end, and you have to start positioning yourself from the future. To what extent, if any, should the U.S. overtly support the Iranian Green Movement? Why was the current administration so visibly silent during 2009? Ooh, boy, you're hitting me with some good ones, aren't you? Um, the, uh, I, I, having looked at this, you know, the, the public statements, I think, are quite accurate about the, the Obama administration's dilemma with the Green Movement. On one hand, they did want, you know, there, there was a, a real desire to try to support them. They seemed like, uh, 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 it seemed like a movement that was tailor-made for what would be an American interest. Um, and there were a lot of young liberals, a lot of very uh, pro-American Democrats in the movement. 
On the other hand, however, overtly supporting them would, would, do, would do, first of all, a lot of the members of the Green Movement didn't want it. Um, and second of all, it would really strengthen the hardliners in the government's uh, rationale that this entire upheaval was entirely instigated by the United States. And they and probably would have just uh, heavily crushed it. So it was a real p uh, policy dilemma. Um, could we have handled a little better? Maybe we could have. But frankly, sometimes I think events in these countries are, despite everybody in the Middle East thinking the U.S. is uh, the great puppet master of everything that happens in the region, some of these events are beyond our capability. And sometimes it is better just to, to support them at least uh, uh, publicly, but uh, um, uh, but really. Watch, watch what you do. The other piece to this is, the, uh, um, is what Obama also was hoping. He was, he was still hoping for a deal with, on the nuclear issue at the same time. So he's also caught with, okay, I could really undermine this government. I could support the opposition movement, but that would also probably scuttle any chance for a nuclear deal with the Islamic Republic at the same time. So it's, it's, uh, it was not an easy decision for, for the administration. How does Sharia law fit in? Who's in control, and could you comment on the tribal relationships? Mm. Um, uh, you know, I think Henry Kissinger famously cause, uh, uh, referred to Iran as a cause, not a country. And they are certainly motivated, Supreme Leader certainly is motivated by this idea of, of being the defender of the Shia community worldwide. It, it's, a, it's a part and parcel to, to uh, the way the Iran views the world. It's their main reason for supporting Hezbollah in addition to providing them strategic reach. They have a lot of a long uh, standing ties that go back many years with the Shia community in Lebanon. And it's also some of their view in Iraq, particularly uh, uh, under Saddam Hussein. So it, it, it does motivate them. It's one of their foreign policy objectives. Is it the most dominant one? It depends, frankly, on who you talk to. Um, I think there's a lot of elements of Iran that if you replaced Ayatollah uh, Khamenei with uh, the, you know, the Shah of Iran, you would find there's a lot of overlap in their policies. There's sort of an Iranian regional view of the, uh, the world that, um, that I think motivates them equally as much as this larger desire of being a protector of the Shia uh, in a very Sunni part of the world. The tribal issues uh, is, is complicated. Frankly, um, um, other, you know, there, there's two main groups, you know, primarily the Baluchs in the south and the Kurds, both of whom have, have, have um, uh, separatist movements that have been thorns in the side of Iran for many years, and Iran always is accusing the United States and Israel of supporting both of them. Um, they are, uh, I, none of them I don't think are significant enough to really cha uh, challenge what is you know, the, the core group of, of the Persians, which I think will continue to dominate the country. Um, so. How did President Carter err? Uh, what mistakes did he make in bringing down the Shah? Well, I, I said one already, which was uh, he was frankly divided between two competing views. Um, and and, and for, in fairness to, to Carter, I think it, it was not an easy proposition any more than any of these, these, these issues are. Um, uh, I think that was a, a, an absolute, uh, a, a major mistake. I don't think the other mistake, uh, frankly, which was not all Carter, it was a continuation of Nixon's policies, was what Stan Escudero objected to. It's why his career was put on the back burner, was the wisdom of putting all the American security eggs in the Shah's basket. Uh, you lose that, that major stone and, and your entire security apparatus in the Middle East collapses, which is precisely what happened when the Shah fell. Um, it, you know, it ends up uh, it's one of the main reasons we, f we find ourselves in the situation we're in today with a large military presence. And it really started as a, as a byproduct of the Cold War in some respects. But, um, but frankly, I think Carter did do, uh, you know, having, having just uh, bashed him, I will say one thing about him that I think is also positive. He does set in place a U.S. defense policy that carries on to this day, the U.S. Central Command. Um, while his original concept was a rapid deployment force, there was always some discussion that this would eventually morph into a larger major theater command. And a lot of the early basing agreements that were done with Egypt and others that we still rely on to this day to support U.S. military operations in the Middle East, a lot of those were started under Carter and under the need for the rapid deployment force, General P.X. Kelly uh, uh, being a, a major player in a lot of this as the first rapid deployment force commander. 
Um, so despite his uh, perhaps errors on, uh, early on, I think uh, at the end of his administration, he does tee the U.S. up and Reagan for success. That's the shortest answer I've ever heard from an intelligent person when <laughs> asked about President Carter's <laughs> mistakes. <laughs> what, is the, what is the Christian population in Iran? How are they treated? And uh, there's a petition pending in the U.S. Congress about Turkey, Iraq, Egypt, uh, and Iran's minority Christian population. How are the Christians treated? In, in Iraq, I'm sorry? In Iraq. Uh, in Iraq, the minority? In, in Iran, sorry. Oh, in Iran, the, the minority groups in Iran? Yes. Uh, ooh, uh, the, the Christians specifically? Uh, I'm probably not the right guy to, to ask that question. Um, I'm, not a, I'm really not an expert on the Christians inside Iran um, or, or the, the Jewish population, which has always been fairly substantial in Iran, too, although much diminished since 1979. Okay. In your book, you discussed Operation Earnest Will, the tanker war 1978. What impact did that have on Iran's thinking of a future conflict with the U.S. Navy? Uh, that's a great question. Um, the, uh, I described sort of a military conflict that I spent some time in the book. I mentioned uh, Reagan interjects U.S. forces after Iran expands the war in the, in, the, in the Gulf. It'll lead to probably one of the most unique naval campaigns the U.S. Navy uh, has ever under, uh, engaged in. And frankly, it was a pretty courageous act by Ronald Reagan. Uh, because every senior Navy commander and the Secretary of the Navy strongly opposed the entire operation, um, believing that it was a wrong war, the wrong time, the wrong place. Why get in the middle of the Iran-Iraq war? None of it's made any sense. Persian Gulf, who cares? Um, it's not the Atlantic or Pacific, which was their focus at the time. Um, and the U.S. does this, but it's a very unorthodox military campaign because Iran doesn't have much capability to challenge the U.S. Navy. So what they rely on is two key things. They rely on mines and they rely on these Revolutionary Guard speedboats. If you can imagine your bass boat with a rocket launcher on the front, that's essentially what they used. And, uh, and they tried, and they used this they, asymmetric tactics. They tried to take on the U.S. sort of indirectly, lay mines and these kind of stuff, things that would provide them plausible deniability or because um, sometimes it's hard to predict in the middle of an ocean who laid the mine. And it was pretty successful. Iran laid 91 mines in the, in the course of this against the United States, and about one in 10 found a, a victim. Um, one $1,500 World War I era mine that the Iranians were using nearly sank a half a billion dollar U.S. warship. So pretty good uh, bang for the buck, so to speak. And these small boats, while they couldn't sink a warship, if they swarmed it, they could inflict a lot of damage on it. And, you know, you attack by 10 or 15 of these small boats, it, it uh, really has a, an impact. Ultimately, it failed from their perspective. The U.S. Um, uh, really had a lot of imaginative ways to counter these, these sorts of actions. But when the war ended, Iran takes a hard look. In fact, there's a meeting in Tehran in 1991 where they look at the recent desert storm and they look at their last conflict with the U.S. and they come to the conclusion that their strategy had been correct, but really they just didn't have the means to properly implement it. That this combination of these small boats and swarms and mines and perhaps augmented by missiles launched off, anti-ship missiles off the land, could overwhelm a much more sophisticated American adversary. And so they built a, a military structure that really is designed to, to, to accentuate everything they tried 20 years ago against, 25 years ago against the United States. Only today, they really do have the capability. We're not talking your bass boat with an RPG, although they still have about 3,000 of those, I might add. But it's also augmented by ships with, with, with wake homing torpedoes, with short-range anti-ship uh, missiles that are very hard to detect until they're on top of you. And, the, and they've perfected, or at least tried to perfect, these swarm tactics. So these types of ship uh, will hit a U.S. warship all at once and, frankly, overwhelm its defenses. It's, it's worried about defeating a torpedo. It, it, it's hit by a, an anti-ship missile. If it's dealt, dealing with those two facts, uh, threats, a small boat with a machine gun knocks out its radar. And so this is kind of their, their design. And the mines, they've really, really uh, sunk. In fact, uh, January of last year, uh, uh, Admiral Sayari, uh, the, the head of the regular Iranian Navy, made a statement that um, 
uh, essentially saying we can close the Strait of Hormuz whenever we want with our mines, essentially uh, uh, putting the U.S. on notice of that. They have perhaps 5,000 mines now. Many are still this old or one uh, technology, but if you hit it, it's still pretty deadly. But they also have augmented this with much more sophisticated uh, uh, bottom influence mines that, that can do a tremendous amount of damage. And they've really started working on how to do decentralized operations. So you don't have these ships coming out with 100 mines in the back to lay a minefield. You can have 20 or 30 ships coming using GPS, all converging on the same location from multiple spots and hastily laying a minefield. And so it has, unfortunately, the US Navy, I don't think, internalized nearly as many lessons of our last conflict as Iran did. But it has, uh, frankly, you cannot understand the way the Iran is going to approach a conflict with the United States unless you look at the conflict 25 years ago. I mean, it's just, it, it really is. It's, it's like looking at uh, a, a modern day American aircraft carrier without understanding World War II. It's just, it makes no sense. We have uh, several questions <laughs> about uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, is there, uh, is the nuclear ish issue real or uh, hyperbole? We heard all about Iraq's weapons of mass destruction and that didn't uh, occur. What's the correct policy to address the nuclear weapon issue, weapons of mass destruction, containment or strike? Uh, could you comment? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, uh, it, it may, may turn out we, we, we uh, got it wrong with Iraq and we got it right in Iran, but uh, unfortunately getting it wrong the first time is going to undermine us. Um, there is there is e uh, quite a lot of evidence that Iran toyed with, um, especially in the 90s and maybe up to 2003, weapons design. Uh, uh, the facility of Parchin, uh, which is one of their big uh, main military bases, uh, there's a lot of suspicion of uh, a triggering device was tested for uh, a nuclear warhead. Uh, we found computers and laptops and, and other information with designs of uh, warheads to go on their ballistic missiles. So it's pretty obvious that they've, they've looked at a weaponization program, at least uh, conceptually. However, there is no evidence, at least that I've seen, um, that, uh, that Iran has, ever, has made the decision, the Supreme Leader has made the decision to actually go for a nuclear weapon. What I think he wants is the capability of a, of a nuclear weapon. I think he frankly, Saddam Hussein had some of these same views. It's, it's kind of nice in a nasty region like the Middle East to have ambiguity about what your capabilities are. Um, and the Israeli nuclear program has been uh, based on that for, for a number of years. Um, and so I think they like it. They would like the ability if they wanted to develop it for their interest to quickly have the breakout capability, uh, which would mean taking essentially up to that threshold. Whether they intend to actually implement it or not, I, 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 right now I think probably not, but you know, circumstances change. Um, uh, there is, uh, frankly, there is a problem that with, with, I think, American credibility sometimes on this issue um, because we did get it so wrong in Iraq and we we're so certain that we had it right. Uh, slam dunk, I think, as, as George Tenet described it. Um, so there is some, uh, I mean, there certainly is a, 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 an effort within the intelligence community to make sure that they don't duplicate those same mistakes that they did. I mean, if, frankly, if you start really going back and looking at their, their, the assumptions that were in a lot of the presidential daily briefings on Iraq, you start looking at them and peeling them back on what the sources is. You know, the curveball one is perhaps the most obvious example. You start, I mean, a lot of it does fall apart. And there's a lot more rigor that goes on now as far as the intelligence analysts go is about listing sourcing and, and really justifying it based upon high, low, and moderate confidence in the information. Um, so we're better at it as, a, as an institution, I think. Um, We've heard a lot about the level of uh, education uh, within Iran and the uh, amount of communication today. Is there a legitimate dissident movement in Iran and, and could that be fostered? Yeah, go, uh, my uh, earlier comments, boy, that's something I think everybody's thought about again, as I said, for, for 30 years. Can we find people we can, can use? Uh, the Green Movement, uh, uh, other dissidents. Um, in Carter and early Reagan, it was uh, old Shaw Royalists, um, these sorts of things that they looked at uh, to finding that could use. Um, and none of them really panned out. There's only one real effective coup that the Army, that might have, might have supported in 1980, the Noje coup that the Iranian Air Force tried. But uh, 
um, but it was pretty half-baked in many ways. Um, my view is there is dissatisfaction in Iran. I don't think there's much. I mean, what you saw in June of 2009 um, uh, shows that, although a lot of those were, were from North Tehran. They're the educated students and that kind of thing. It, it doesn't spread so much into the rural area where the regime does have support. Um, there is dissatisfaction. I think even the Iranians are worried about it. Um, in fact, the Iranians are worried that they, as they start looking at these economic sanctions, some of them have, have said publicly and privately the, that as the, uh, uh, as, as, you know, the, the sanctions bite, uh, that Iran needs to stand up like they did during the Iran-Iraq war, sort of suck it up and, and fight for the revolution and endure a hardship, and they're not sure the younger generation can quite endure it in, in the same way that they could. They're, you know, too addicted to uh, all the, the material trappings of the West and, and this kind of thing. So uh, they may not. So they are worried about it. Whether, whether it rises to a level that will challenge the regime, I tend to doubt it. Now, my view is, th is that what will change in Iran is not going to be revolutionary. It's going to be evolutionary. And uh, it's going to take time. And, and frankly, the revolutionary generation is, is going to have to die off. And we'll see what replaces it. Uh, this current supreme leader and, and how it evolves, but I think um, I wouldn't hold your breath that there's some magic group that we can throw some weapons at and this support and, and, and change this regime. This question is about uh, Iran, Israel, and Syria. Uh, how involved has uh, Syria been in Iran and vice versa, and what changes do you foresee now with what's going on in Syria? Yeah, well, that's, that's the... Uh, that's the $64,000 question right now, I think, in the Middle East, at least as far as Iran watchers go. Um, Syria's involvement in Iran hasn't been that substantial, although uh, during the Iran-Iraq war, they did mass some forces along the border to make Saddam Hussein nervous. Um, the, the two Ba'ath Party members uh, largely dislike despising each other. So, and they've had a very close rapport um, uh, that goes back really to the founding of the revolution, in part because of the enemy of my enemy is my friend in the Middle East. Uh, both countries hated Iraq, both countries hated Israel. And, uh, and Syria was key, is key, to Iran's ability to support and su uh, sustain Hezbollah. Um, uh, you know, most of the weapons flow in through the Syrian airport, or at least they did. Um, uh, Syria has facilitated it for years. Um, now everything's a, a, a different ball game. The, the, ever since the revolution, Iran has, I think, done everything they can to try to prop up this, this government. Uh, there's, an, I think, an unprecedented level of Iranian uh, 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 Revolutionary Guard support and troops in Syria. Um, there was a report, uh, a news report there, there. It's pretty widespread. At least most of the Syrians think that the, the Iranians are actually up on the front lines fighting. <coughs> It would maybe a bit of a stretch, but they certainly are doing everything they can to, uh, to support the Syrian government, because if they lose it, they lose the only nation state in the entire region that's one of their, their allies or supporters. And it really puts them in a bind. It puts them in a bind to support uh, 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 Hezbollah. It puts them in a bind uh, as far as uh, their ability to actually influence Israel in a, a negative way, if you will, um, to actually strike back at Israel. Um, which they see provides them some kind of deterrent capability and leverage. Um, and if that happens, um, regardless of who takes over, and I'm not confident that whoever takes over in Syria after Assad may even be, is going to be terribly pro-American, but the one thing is they will not be pro-Iranian, pro and Iran knows this. And I think they will, it will lead to Iran probably upping its effort in Iraq and other, other places to try to gain some kind of a, uh, again, some more regional support so they're not so isolated. We have a, an administration now in their second term with a new uh, soon-to-be Secretary of State. Uh, how do you see the relationships between the U.S. and Iran under those circumstances, and do you think this would have been any different with a Republican administration? Mm. Mm. Ooh, boy. I I don't. I hate to engage in these sorts of speculative questions because uh, uh, I will get myself in trouble uh, on both parties, probably. Um, having just praised uh, President uh, Carter, which I, I don't in many places in the book, but uh, um, the uh, you know, oddly enough, that's a, 
I used to say this, I said this in a few other talks, that one of the interesting things about Iran, and if you look at American policy towards Iran, is it's really not a Republican or Democratic issue. Oddly enough, there's a lot of continuity across the spectrum. There's divisions, but a lot of the divisions center around individuals' views, not a party. And frankly, if you looked at the presidential debates, it was kind of hard to distinguish which, which uh, side was more hawkish on Iran. Um, and they sort of both ran in the same, same way. Um, Obama made an opening early in his administration to extend a hand. He made very public uh, uh, pronouncements, uh, uh, Nuru's uh, message on Iranian New Year, all these. But frankly, if you look at what Bush was doing behind the scenes his last term, there was a lot of efforts of the U.S. Condi Rice said, I'll sit down, if you stop in Richmond, I'll sit down and talk with the Iranians about any subject that they want. There was a lot of outreach in the Bush, in the second Bush term, too. Um, uh, Clinton uh, uh, made a series of openings to the Iranians late and, and very nearly went to war after Kobar Towers with the Iranians, in a, in a way. So I, I, the, the interesting aspect, and frankly, Obama's current uh, policies is, is in many ways a very much a continuation of a lot of the things Bush put in, in place. So there is a lot of continuity across the spectrum. So from my view, depending upon if it had been a President Romney, uh, depending on who he brought in as advisors and their own, own specific views, that would have been the change. Not really, not really a party affiliation. If uh, Israel does attack Iran, what should the U.S. do and what do you think the U.S. will do? Uh, <laughs> Well, I, I hope we can avoid that is my, my opening uh, thing. I, I think a, a war and something like that would not be in anyone's interest. So I, I hope there is a peaceful resolution, at least to the nuclear aspect of it. Um, you know, wars are easier to start than they are to stop, and sometimes you don't know which way they go. Um, and frankly, how Iran would respond to, Iranian, uh, to an Israeli strike is, is frankly an open guess right now, um, uh, whether they would you know, unleash Hezbollah or whether they would, uh, you know, play victim, who knows. Um, the, uh, uh, and whether the Israelis will strike is, is, again, another issue that I don't think anyone is quite sure of. Um, I think the, uh, it's, a, it's a handy uh, tool for the Israelis to continue because it does keep international pressure on. Um, but I'm also convinced that if they think Iran is going to go for uh, a nuclear weapon and, no, and the U.S. or nobody's, uh, another country is going to do anything about it, I think they will take military action. And, uh, and again, then it will purely depend on Iran's response to it, um, and whether it drags the U.S. into the conflict or not. Along those lines, would you talk a little bit about the political power uh, in Iran, given the, they have a president and they have religious leaders, and where that exactly lies and how that uh, would manifest itself. Yeah, that's, it is a convoluted government, and it was set up uh, deliberately with a bunch of diffused el um, power bases. Um, and remember, they used to have a prime minister at one time, too. And, uh, but, um, uh, you know, ultimately the supreme leader is the decider, if you will. Most of the tough decisions, particularly on, say, nuclear issues or major national security issues, all default to the supreme leader. Um, the president, uh, uh, or the, as original concept, if you remember, Johnny could have been the supreme leader. Instead, he turned it down thinking the presidency was going to be the more powerful position long term. The supreme leader would be more of a, oh, a symbol of the state, a religious uh, uh, scholar, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, Hamani has done a very good job uh, wielding the power and consolidating it under himself. So I think it's uh, uh, the, the presidency. And frankly, you know, we like to think that there's, um, for example, when Ahmadinejad was, uh, uh, when he, you know, I guess he's about to be the ex-president here this year, but Ahmadinejad and the Supreme Leader, despite uh, uh, the Supreme Leader's support for his re-election in 2009 during the, the, the Green Movement crisis and all that, the two really don't care for each other. They're at odds politically. They have uh, huge policy disagreements. Um, there was an issue over uh, the head of uh, uh, the security services uh, a few years ago where um, they had a dispute over one that whether a guy should be relieved or, or, or stay in the uh, Supreme Council of National Security, which is sort of their version of the NSC. 
and uh, and, Ahmed, and the Supreme Leader won. He publicly uh, rebuked uh, uh, Ahmadinejad. Um, so, uh, you know, it's certainly not a monolith in Iran. There's a lot of different competing views and uh, views over the United States between accommodation versus serious distrust of American motives. Um, uh, guys like uh, General Soleimani, who's head of the Quds Forces, I think is eagerly uh, looking for a conflict with the United States. Others don't have that view. They're a lot more cautious. So there's just a, a tremendous amount of different views within Iran. It's part of the reason that everything seems to default to the supreme leader, because the bureaucracy, or the, even, even at a senior level, can't always agree on a, on a course of action. So hence, it always has to default to the supreme leader. That used to apparently annoy Ayatollah Khomeini to no end. But um, uh, it is... It, it is uh, it is complicated and it is a diffuse power base. There was a movement, uh, I don't think it's going to happen, but there was some discussion in Iran uh, a year or so ago that the Supreme Leader was just going to abolish the presidential position because every one of them has been a pain in his side with trying to establish their own independent base of power and, and maybe not do what he wants, but I think that's died down. So it's a question of whether the next president's going to be sort of a puppet or somebody thinks he can control or whether it really will be a more independent actor. We'll wait and see this, uh, this spring. And Dr. Chris, this last question, could you talk uh, more about the difficulty of placing covert agents in Iran uh, today under the current circumstances? And was Iran nuclear scientist Sharam, uh, I think Amiri, a genuine defector or a double agent? Uh, I'm, I don't really want to go into the first question at all. Uh, I, I don't want to, I can talk about the history of that, but I, I don't want to get into anything current uh, as far as you know, planning agents in Iran. Um, I think Amiri was a legitimate defector. Uh, he was a, a reigning nuclear scientist. He went on the Hajj, was suddenly disappeared. Iran wasn't quite sure where he had gone to, uh, whether he had been kidnapped, killed, whatever, and he shows up uh, in all places, New Mexico. Um, he, uh, um, but I, I he was also a guy who was very homesick. I've never been a defector. I don't know what that must be like. But when you leave your wife and your, your young son and all the rest at home and you, can't, you have no contact with them, I think it really weighed on him. So he made the mistake of reaching out and calling home uh, and, of course, waiting on the other end were the Iranian security services, who now realize that he was very much alive in the United States. And so it was a convoluted story where he issues a, comes out with a YouTube video that says he was abducted and, and coerced and this kind of thing, uh, which I think was probably done uh, to satisfy uh, uh, the Iranians who I th were making veiled threats against his family if he didn't uh, cooperate. Then the U.S. government comes out with another video with him in it that is much more positive and a little bit more professionally done. And then ultimately, uh, Amiri shows up at uh, the Pakistani interest section in Washington, D.C., and requests uh, a flight to go back home, uh, where he's greeted as a hero initially, uh, and Iran, Iran tries to publicly say that he had been captured and the U.S. had tortured him and forced him to confess uh, to being part of the nuclear, this Iranian nuclear program and the weapons, weapons program. Um, but then once it died down, I was reading a report not too long ago, and uh, 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 I forget what newspaper it was in, but he's apparently been rearrested now and is in jail. Uh, so, uh, which is an indication that it, you know, it probably was. You never know in the world of, of that uh, of spies whether a person is a defector, or a double agent, or I mean that happened with the Soviets where they'd send over a guy we thought was a defector. Turns out he wasn't. But in this case, I tend to think it was it was probably legitimate. Thank you, That's it. Thank you. This concludes our program for this evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we do have uh, Books, Inc. here available after the uh, speech over here, and Dr. Christ will be available to sign the books. Thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience. We appreciate your participation. Good evening.